Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today on Deep Thoughts, we're going to go deep, really deep, into the concept of living in a matrix. This episode wouldn't be possible if I hadn't made all the other episodes about similar thinking. So, this is called Matrix Programming, and what is it going to be about? Well, this is going to be about a, an exercise. This is something we would do at Deep Thoughts University. Where we're going to pull back and we're going to say, okay, a lot of people have this feeling of the matrix, especially since the movie in 1999. We have a word for it, which is fantastic. And again, how great is that? You know, not having a word for something means that trying to accomplish it's going to be increasingly difficult to, you know, conversate about. But now, what has been the sort of scientific pontifications about being in a matrix? You have individuals who are scientists, computer scientists, physicists, cosmologists, people who study the universe and how it's put together. Of course, they're all standing on the shoulders of probably uh, Tesla's era back geniuses, Tesla's there up front, you know, with Einstein up, absolute theoretical deceivers, Tesla being one of the last people who got everything, you know. But what you'll read if you get into articles in rags about people saying, well, you know, there is a lot of evidence that we could potentially live in a computer simulation. All right. And they're trying to find correlating evidence in the universe that correlates with how we program computers. Okay, it's not a bad approach. What are you going to do? You got to deal with, you got to use things that you understand and things that the world understands. Probably one of the toughest things to do is if you were to ever advance your thinking beyond your ability to articulate and explain it to another human being, then you would be stuck in a vacuum of perhaps all knowledge without the capability of sharing it with another human being. Well, yours truly was an engineer from a very young age. I watched computers come up from the late 70s. I became a programmer technically at, um, I guess you could say more 13, but I dabbled in, you know, binary illustrations at, nine, at 11, excuse me, because of my uncle. You guys know the story. If you're listening, if you're listeners, but what I want to do is take us up to another level of thinking. And you guys are ready. Your hardcore people are absolutely ready. For those of you who just joined the show because of a referral or you just slipped into this episode, I hope you're ready. I hope you're going to really enjoy this. And if you dig this kind of talking, this is what the whole show is about. Like, subscribe, all that good stuff. What is a program? At its most fundamental state, what is a program? How would you describe it to some first year students in perhaps junior high, maybe even grade school? A little bit easier in junior high, much easier in high school. Because kids program at all levels today, it is wonderful. I mean, this conversation is not even remotely difficult like it was when I was a kid. But it's a collection of instructions to tell a bunch of hardware what to do and when to do it. There are a series of instructions that are going to run regardless of anything that you do with the program once you tell it to run. And then there's a bunch of commands and instructions that are waiting for you to interact with the hardware device via a mouse, a keyboard, maybe a touch screen, maybe a bunch of other wild devices. And then it's going to do something. Based on what you do, it's supposed to do the right thing, whatever you want it to do. Video games are a great example. You touch a thing, your character moves. So we need to put that in our brain. It's part of our quiver. We're getting ready for this battle, this conversation here. To hopefully enlighten ourselves, enlighten ourselves even further as to how this could possibly have come together. So when we think about our reality, we usually, from a physics standpoint the bits and pieces that the universe is made out of because physicists have the responsibility of determining what are the Lego blocks that build this universe. 
Then, once they figure out the subatomic reality of our existence as best they can, with their albeit very close-minded thinking, they hand up those sheets to your people like cosmologists, which go, okay, so these are the fundamental pieces, and a chemist will go one way, and a biochemist will go the other way. But they're looking at, okay, well, maybe the earth is made like this. Maybe the sun's made like that, et cetera, et cetera. But even that divides up really quickly. Because the person who's trying to prove the human body, which is an organic entity, is sort of in a completely different wheelhouse of thinking than someone who's trying to figure out why rock stacks up the way it stacks up. Why does a diamond exist? Where the hell does crude oil shit come from? Why is the sun hot? Why doesn't it burn out? Why does the earth expand 19 centimeters a year? Why do when we hit the, the moon, it rang like a bell? Hmm. If we indeed did that. I think it's very interesting when NASA admitted that they slammed a big piece of copper, I believe, into the south pole of the moon to kick up a bunch of dust so they could look at it in a spectrogram, try to find out what its chemical composition was. They said it rang like a bell. All right. Well, it's a weird thing to say if they didn't do it. I think hurling a big piece of copper at it is probably possible, regardless of where it is and how big it is. So we have that tangible reality that we always refer to on the show. Hmm. How does this show come about? Well, it's a bunch of inanimate hardware that exacerbates the flow of electrons. Electrons made possible by ethereal collisions at various speeds. Ether is called different things. At a very high speed, it's called plasma. At a slower speed, it's called an electron, a proton, a neutron, etc. So we have all that tangible stuff too. Ah, but then we have a whole nother realm that is ignored by scientists categorically. Maybe your psychologist will think about it. Your psychiatrist might think about it. And then that stuff's called love, hate, anger, happiness, indifference, the emotional layer. Your Kurtzwells, your sort of pseudo neurologist will say, oh, that's just a bunch of chemical states in your brain that create all these amazing, passionate things. And then you see a little video of a crab protecting his crab friend or his crab girlfriend or whatever, and a little human reaches out and grabs the claw of the one that's being hugged, and the little crab just looks over and fucking takes his little claw and just get the hell away from her. He actually sets the it looks like a girl, right? I mean, the whole thing's like a girl and there's a dude around her. He gets over there and starts swatting the hand. Like, Get away from her. You know, he comes back over and hugs his girlfriend, right? Amazing. Okay. So if we're going to talk about a matrix programmer, we got to take all this into account. These are the bits and pieces of which the programmer creating the instruction set will have to deal with. What else is out there that governs this whole thing? Well, you can't hear me create phonetic expressions in what Mike Myers so beautifully called syllables if you don't have the concept of time passing. Now, we've struggled with time on this show. I've got a whole episode on it. I've got time travel episodes. I've got just straight up time episodes, I believe. But it's all about the accumulation of state changes in some database that exists somewhere that we have access to, our own personal little database. Hmm. For any of you who have meditated on a subject and you feel like you've dragged truth out of the universe without reading a book and you're able to deduce something big, uh, sort of beyond your academic adventures, you start to think, hmm, I think there's a database that's like the database and I have the ability to construct a query, send it out to the universe and get an answer back. But I must construct a query that I understand. And I must ask for, as a database programmer, the field data coming back that I will understand. And I'll give an example. A database record is nothing more than a little, you know, five by three note card with some stuff on it. When you used to have recipe boxes go between family members, right? 
it was always these are the ingredients you need and the amounts you need and then here's the here are the instructions on how to put it all together how to set your oven up how to mix everything together what order to mix things together what not to do what to do cook angel cake and you'll find out there's a lot of tricks with just constructing a cake the angel cake can fall if it falls you have angel mud so time is an element there seems to be you know this reemergence of interest in time travel because of some interesting misdirections online one of them being that uh project looking glass which i did an episode on if you'd like to dive into that please see that episode but the subject matter comes up and i'm going to just re-explain it so we have a little bit of a platform here to understand where we're going but it's interesting how when you first conceive of time it's always a very linear thing i was young once and now i'm not so young i was small once and i'm not so small anymore if you've ever seen a friend pass away due to old age a relative or something you understand that we have a limited time on this planet no matter how creative we are about the subject matter and so time travel stories typically adhere initially to a linear time theory what's that mean well if you go back to 1865 you might meet abe lincoln in your time frame if you killed abe lincoln he won't exist in your future when you go back home to your time like you had him in your books. You killed him, not John Wilkes Booth. If you killed Hitler when he was a baby, well, World War II doesn't happen. At least the way that they planned it and pulled it off. Okay, so it's linear time travel. Lately on the internet, I find it fascinating that a lot of people seem to be making these videos about Project Looking Glass and their profound statement at the beginning of the episode as if they have the i don't know the coup de gras of all time travel information they're going to let their audience know that time is non-linear what's that mean well that means that there is more than one time uh, happening at the same time that there's two versions usually this is the way it's told there's two versions of you there's two versions of everything that's ever happened and they jump to the other time they make some changes and they come back to this time. Supposedly there's value there, right? It's two different universes, man, if, if that were true. A mathematician, a physicist, will often look at that and say, well, if there is nonlinear time, meaning multiple times at the same time, then one must instantaneously acknowledge that there is infinite time, meaning every possible conceivable thing it could happen in the universe at any time or place has happened and if you are traveling between these frequencies between these frequencies of time then you are merely viewing into someone else's time and it has nothing to do with your own it would be like waking up from a dream and holding an object that you dreamed about your dream is its own time frame you know that you can't take something out of a dream and pull it into this world because it only exists in that time so i find these conversations about time and the project looking glass to be absolutely infinitely hilarious and wholly inaccurate as to what comes out of their mouth next because their theory is that you can go look at another time find a prediction come back into your time and it applies oh maybe you know if you were to do an infinitely tiny slice of a time difference then that time frame is almost identical to yours. Maybe my hair, you know, number 27 is a little bit over here. Well, if there's infinite time, my hair is in every particular state it could possibly be, and yet everything else was the same. All those universes would exist. Hmm. But now when I write a program today, regardless of where the program is located in the world, in your telephone, in your toaster, in your TV, or on the internet, in your computer as a video game or whatever. What it's really doing is it's merely managing electrons through transistors. It is loading up memory in particular states. It is also transposing the more fluid electricity that goes through the circuitry in your computer, sometimes down to a hard drive, down to flash memory, and it stores it. It stores a previous state, 
I wrote a letter to my mom. Well, there it is. I wrote her that letter in 1987, and I saved it on a floppy. Then when floppies were going out of style, I transferred it onto my hard drive. Then for backup reasons, I put it on a disc. The hard drive went away. I resurrected the disc out of my garage. When I, discs were going out, I put it into the cloud. And now I still have Word documents from 1987 with all their misspellings. Okay. But what if I said to a programmer today, especially a young kid, let's say he's like, he or she is like, we'll do she today. I say to her, hey, did you just write a program? Yep. What does it do? And she shows me a little game that she made. I said, man, that is amazing. You are one incredible kid and your future is going to be as bright as you could possibly imagine it. So think big, dream big, because you can get everything that you can conceive of that can happen in this universe. And she smiles and thinks about herself, you know, it's good. But now what if I said to her, you know what you should do for your next program? And she says, what? And I said, well, you should write a program that changes the computer color of your laptop and she goes what yeah you know your laptop's like this aluminum color right yeah well why don't you make it like purple why don't you write a program that changes the outside of the metal to have like your favorite movie poster on it she's like what are you talking about you can't do that and i said why not she goes well it's it's not part of you know the programming world it's 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 the Computer body on the outside has nothing to do with what the program can control. Ah, now we've opened up where I need our brains to be in order to have this conversation about a matrix programmer. Someone asked me recently, do you think we've discovered mathematics or did we create mathematics? Well, I think the answer is pretty clear, but I appreciate the question which is we do discover it. But what's interesting about mathematics is it's sort of like our time argument. Someone might say, well, I discovered addition. I discovered subtraction, multiplication, and division. Okay, so you have the building blocks for mathematics. There are plenty of other operators that exist in mathematics, especially when you get into coding, that do interesting things to numbers converts them from base 10 to base 2 to base 16. All these different things. But now, if you were going to build the universe, I mean, let's just face it, even if you believe the place is flat inside of a snow globe or you think it's a heliocentric ball flying in space, it's a big place. There's a whole lot of stuff moving around, right? There's a whole lot of this mass stuff that we talk about, which is slow moving ether. And so, eh, you know, I don't know. How do you just write a program that would change things that seem to be set in motion? Right? When you learn about electronics, they usually teach you very quickly in electronics that electrons move a lot like water. And you know why? Because it's ether. And ether moves exactly like water. Ether is the OG water, just so that you know. And everything that's built from it operates just like it. The blood moving through the vessels in your body. The reason why the arteries in your lungs look exactly like the branches on a tree. It's because it's the same mathematics. But now let's think about it. If you wanted um, to write some security software whereby if you leave your computer for a certain amount of time, maybe even some super advanced software, and if you literally walk away from your computer a certain number of feet, that's an indicator you're no longer paying attention to your computer, and it just takes whatever's on the screen and puts up the padlock uh, interface in case some other human being comes up to the computer and it says, uh, who the hell are you? Or it senses you re-entering the room from the bathroom or wherever you went, and it reads your bio signature and it opens your computer back up. So at all times, your computer is safe as long as you're in proximity of it. Perhaps it's reading your face and saying well, he or she is looking at the computer. Now let's let him see the monitor again. Hmm. Well, as an engineer, you could pretty much, even not even being a coder, you could probably conceive of, at least theoretically, 
how that would work. Something in the room is sensing where you are, how you're orientated towards the computer or away from the computer. What if when you looked away from the computer to grab a piece of paper off the printer, it sensed your face, it wasn't looking at the monitor, and it just blocked it off? And as soon as your face comes back around within a split second, it comes back. Well, something would be running on the side. You'd be running your favorite applications on your operating system of choice. And this other product is taking in data and then scraping the screen and protecting it. Something is intervening in the natural flow of your computer's operation. Hmm. Matrix programmer. There becomes this sort of chicken and egg thing with the matrix concept as it applies to engineering. Now, what I'm going to say is almost, well, it is inconceivable in its totality, but it's not inconceivable in a very basic theory, which would be this. For any of you have played normal pool, you have 15 balls, you rack them up into a triangle shape. You put the cue ball on one side and you hit it. And that sets the game in motion. That really sets up all the moves. What's Maybe a ball goes in. You have a color. If you somehow can get the eight ball to go in. You win the game. Play nine ball. It's a lot easier. But there's this set it up and punch it thing. You don't interact with the balls during the break, I mean, you hit it, and then after the cue ball transfers its potential energy directly into the first ball, and it starts distributing all this energy, something's occurring. Now, you could be a jerk and reach over and touch the balls, but we don't do that, do we? We let it do its thing, and it creates a state when it's all over. All the balls are done moving around. Well, we're in a universe where there appears to be a fundamental particle called an ethereal particle. It is just as nothing as you could possibly imagine, meaning it has no electrical charge to it. It has no color necessarily. It is just this particle. It moves very, very quickly. Not infinite as far as we know. Maybe we haven't been able to sense it moving any time any faster than 50 times the speed of light. But it is everywhere. There are gobs and gobs, these little guys everywhere. And... It's moving everything. It's renewing everything. Like I've said, you are a being that is being renewed every nanosecond, probably even uh, however we could parse time down to the smallest increment. That's how fast you're being fully renewed as a human being. Everything that you see is being renewed. Because all you're seeing is trapped ether creating that thing. This cigar is trapping the currents of ether to create it. But since they've agreed on the pattern of trapping, it remains this fermented tobacco in my hand. Now the tip is a little more excited because it's thermalizing and burning and turning into its fundamental particle carbon. So we like to think about the matrix and we like to think about it being something where perhaps like in the movie, the matrix where this character, Mr. Smith, kept pushing himself all around the matrix and taking over bodies and things, that there would be some form of code that's operating, which allows the fabric of this matrix to be intervened, changed, on demand, by either an engineer or a sub-program that's running, just like the security software. But now, let's think about it. We just had a problem conceiving of a few things because it has the little word infinity associated with it. Infinity is really tough for man to conceive of. In fact, I would wager that no one has ever conceived of infinity in its true sense. I want you to think of every number that exists. Well, that can't be done. We just don't have it. Which I describe as limited by design. You can only fit so many gallons of gas in your gas tank, and then it can't accept any more without some serious distortion of time and space inside the tank, right? Is the universe made out of infinite particles? Mm, we don't know. We don't know. It would seem it would, be, it would be limited, but if it's infinite, then the whole thing is infinite. 
and therefore then the matrix itself becomes inconceivable. But conceptually, something we can talk about. If we were to be a matrix coder, then our program language and the devices by which we save our instructions, which may be a primitive way of even thinking about it, because we are humans, we are dogs, we are cats, we are dolphins, we are planets, we are mountains. These things are finite creations which come with their very designs which instill limitations. We don't think about programs like that. At least most people don't. I don't think we have really, until we get quantum computing up and 100% accurate on a daily basis with say perhaps 300 qubits per computer, we're not really capable of doing that ourselves. But we create facsimiles all the time, don't we? They're called video games. What's funny is I think that there are obviously tens of millions of kids playing video games every single day. I think that probably less than a fraction of a percent of them ever conceive of that game as being a duplicate of their universe that they actually live in. Because of my heritage with computers and video games in general, having 25 years total in the business, I can conceive of the whole thing. When I play World of Warcraft, I can conceive of every single step that Blizzard Entertainment went through to create the game, from the network package design, to the blade server designs, to the overall narrative of the story, the NPCs, the, the real player characters like me in there. As I move around the world flying on a disc or something, I see it in memory moving around. And I still know that there's a massive difference between that and what we're doing. But if you think about it, metaphorically speaking, maybe even technically speaking, you can't do everything you want in a video game. Your character simply can't do it. It's been limited by design. I think mathematics is nothing more than the rule set that is essentially the transistors inside your computer, the logic gates, which decide on a yes-no argument what to do next. But imagine now trying to be a programmer for the matrix. Some people might call that God. I don't disagree. But now imagine taking the, the input that a human does to write a program, which are essentially some commands that we've all decided on, the data that we're creating, which is usually unique to our product, you know, there's this accounting software and we're pressing soft, we're press software, we're pressing software, etc., etc. No matter how fancy our program gets, it's still using the same basic commands to create that experience. As the hardware enhances, so does the interaction with the user. We might gain a few more inputs. Think about a smartphone. We now use our fingers all the time to talk to the screen, which then gets interpreted to the traditional keyboard inputs or the mouse device inputs. But now you're a matrix programmer and you're having to create something that's going to make sense out of this massive, massive soup, which are all the things that we've talked about on this episode so far, an adamant matter of all different states. It's one simple basic thing at the beginning, but boy, howdy, does it create a bunch of different stuff, doesn't it? Wow. Well, how do they create a level in a video game? Someone designs the whole experience, and it's an emotional experience. That's what it's supposed to be. The most simple video game had an emotional experience. In um, Pong, it was you lost track of the ball. It went off on your side, or you made your opponent lose the ball, a little Pong thingy. And you felt either a state of euphoria because you won, or you felt bad because you lost it. Then it advanced up to arcade games and, you know, Space Invaders. You were killing an enemy. That was the metaphor there. Well, then you would get killed yourself if you didn't play it right. On and on and on. Miss Pac-Man got a little bit of a story with some animations. Pac-Man had it too. Then it got into real stories. And now they're movies. They're better than movies half the time. I've played World of Warcraft since 2005. That's 15 years, man. All right. 
But Nat, you are responsible for all the minutia of life. I want you to think for one second about the, um, the amount of experiences that you've had that you could probably, well, you would have a very hard time describing your entire life because how much time would it take you? It would take you more years than you're alive to describe the life that you've lived because any one second is worth days and days and days of description and you know you're still going to miss it. If I had to describe right now what's in my backyard to you with the microphone and a video camera recording it infinitely, I'd be here for a month and I'd still be like, oh, oh and then there's this one, <laughs> you know, all the leaves on this, um, the ivy that's on my back fence. How do I describe all those? And then there's one that's going left, and then there's one that's going right. What's interesting about the Matrix is that I think there, there's an imperative that comes with it. And it's a definite paradox of just the sheer concept of existence. Let's say the Matrix didn't exist, the universe, but there's some party out there that wants to make it. Could be a single life force. Could be some alien somewhere. Where the hell are they? What's keeping them alive? Are they made of one of the things and not all the things? Maybe they're the pure emotional love energy that goes around that we don't talk about because we can't touch it and put it in a jar. But at some point, that being, that entity is going to have to conceive of what hasn't been created yet. And because we know we live in a fairly solid universe, right? Outside of things like Mandela effects or weird things that happen to us. This place is solid, man. You know, I haven't turned in anyone else my whole lifetime that I know of. Um, the, the chairs and the table that I put in the intro a long time ago, they're still right in front of me. And they've never been anything else but that chair and that table. I've painted them white a couple times to get rid of the rust. Clean them off every once in a while. It's solid, but that's hardly an, uh, an example of what's actually going on in this universe. How many people have lived on this planet? Supposedly we have about 7.5 billion people. Well, it's probably safe to say we've had at least double that in the past. Probably. Okay. How many little tiny experiences and huge experiences have all those human beings had by themselves and then with all their family and friends and people they don't even know. It starts to get to that infinite word again. Depending on your beliefs of how the planet was created or the universe was created, how many experiences happened before us? How many are going to happen afterwards? So was there a moment when this actually started? Because that's what the matrix implies. It wasn't here. Someone wrote the program and they hit run. Well, if you study quantum computers and their targeted capabilities by the end of this century, remember that at 300 qubits can conceive of all the grains of sand and probably all the atoms, uh, not, not, ether particles because they don't acknowledge that exists because that explains everything you can't know that but all the subatomic particles that we've identified the quarks for the entire universe which is 300 qubits now it's not stable yet so it's got a lot of errors when they try to do calculations even a fraction of a percent of an error is going to kill the whole system make it unreliable but let's say that by the end of this century we have a thousand qubits that can fit in your hand. It's your new cell phone. That means in your hand, you could hold something that might get to the point where they could conceive of all of the ethereal particles in the universe all at once. Hmm. Wouldn't that be something? There's the theory of the Big Bang. And as it's been explained, it never happened for sure. It, it defies all real theories of gravity. It defies physics as it exists today. It just never happened. However, if you go back to the break in the pool hall, the cue ball hits the other balls and sends them into motion. Because 
we're pretty certain that what you know Tesla through Faraday and then Eric Dollard tracked with ether particles is a fundamental particle. Hey, maybe there's something underneath that. Maybe it's made out of a few little things. Who knows? Maybe there's a couple different sizes. Who knows? This place is moving. This place is constantly fluid. And yet we do have things in this universe. We have emotions in this universe. When I saw Walt Disney at Disneyland walk up to me and tell me that Bob Gurr, the Imagineer, was over there in Tomorrowland and said, said I should go say hi to him. Well, I don't think I need to tell you that Walt died quite a few years ago, about 55 years ago. When I saw him, he was probably gone f for at least uh, 48 years, at least, or maybe, maybe around 50. I don't know. It'd be about 45 years. And so how did that happen? How did that happen? For any of you who've seen relatives that have passed, you've met them wherever you met them, but it was while you were awake. How did that happen? Hmm. I was in a park that Walt designed and built and launched. Hmm. So him being there is kind of interesting. It really shows you there's a lot of options in the universe. And for those who've never seen the show, Bob was standing exactly where Walt took me. And I do not go to that part of the park because I don't like any of the rides over there. And it's for the kitties. And I'm not a kitty. I was hungry. I was hangry. I was supposed to get food in a whole different area of the park. But he interrupted me. And I was like, well, what? You know? Okay. You have to acknowledge those things when you're thinking about how this whole thing works. So now imagine that you're on board with my previous episodes where I say that the soul is in its whole different plane of existence. It is what I like to maybe call your organized energy. It's a really bad description of something very glorious and amazing. But it obviously interacts in a symbiotic way with our vessel. That is why when someone passes away, those that are in the room with them instantaneously realize that body isn't the magical thing it was when it was alive. Because the soul is gone. And regardless if we acknowledge it or not, we are feeling the soul of each other when we're together. Just remember the test I always give you folks. Hopefully you've done it. Get with a loved one. Uh, preferably a partner, but you know anyone that you just have a really good connection with, you're having a really good day with, and stare them in the face. Sit on a sofa, sit in a couple chairs at a restaurant, whatever, and lock eyes and tell them, look me in the eyes. You feel our connection? And they're like, yep, I feel our connection. Okay. You just take your finger, your index finger, and you hold it up and you block the eyeballs. And just hold it. And you ask your friend, how do you feel now? How connected are we are now? Or are we now? And they immediately feel the disconnect. And that is why the eyes have always had the definition of the gateways to the soul. There is something about our eyes. They're not just these apertures that let in, you know, wiggling verbal photons. This verbal reaction off other things, to excite our rods and our cones, to give ourselves an image in the back of our brain, flipped upside down backwards. It's not just that. That's a mechanism to add a little bit more information to the otherwise purely spiritual experience that we're having. Why can we sense people um, staring at us? It's because of the soul, not because of the body. The body may assist the process, but it's not the reason why, definitively. So you're trying to put this place together. Now there's really the chicken and the egg thing for me with the universe goes something like this. We either have a big giant break, just like pool, where all these ether particles were thrown into this area, which is finite, with the finite amount of stuff, although way bigger than us, so we don't sense it. We don't sense the container and we're somehow, from the very, very beginning, we are embedded in the information, which is the ethereal movements. Our designs, homo sapien, cats, insects, planets, the whole ecosystem of how we might be finding ourselves in this plane of existence 
breathing oxygen, needing water, needing food of a certain kind, being able to heal ourselves with things that grow out of the ground instead of taking medicines, the way we did it for centuries and millennia before pharmaceutical companies. Or, so that's the chicken, let's just say. The egg idea might be that this is an infinite container with infinite stuff. And if that's the case, where does the programmer live? And how did all this stuff come, come about? Hmm. It would seem that you, if you had the egg, which is full, infinite, infinite, infinite stuff and in infinite container, always, it would have to be always have been here, right? There's no beginning and there's no end. Even though we as human beings in this vessel have a beginning and a middle and an end, our soul doesn't. And so it understands infinity, but doesn't need to really conceive of it. It's just where it is. If we are a finite amount of stuff in a finite container, ah, well, it still doesn't negate the egg existing around the chicken. There's an infinite something around us, and perhaps we are merely an instance of the outer infin infinity. So we're in a container. And that's really where we have a Russian doll sequence going on. Let's say the outside is infinite. Infinite stuff in an infinite container always has been. And maybe it's different out there. And maybe some ether running around, but it doesn't control anything because we're ma mainly soul beings out there. And that stuff cute. That's cool. You know what we could do? What? I'm bored as hell. Me too, man. Being a Q really sucks sometimes. Yeah. I thought we could get some of this ether shit, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. And I got that old box. Remember you gave me that gift? That, that sphere thing you gave me? Okay, yeah. Well, I'll get the crap out of the sphere. And I've been playing with this stuff. I got these kind of like these rules of which things kind of operate, right? I call it mathematics. Oh, that's a great name. A lot of syllables in that. Maybe you should try to trim that out one day. We'll get to that later. It's called math. How about that? One syllable. Boom. Good. But if we create a little opening in this thing, we can throw a bunch of stuff in it pre-programmed to have this really cool scenario and then we'll cap it off and it'll just happen and we can just sit there and watch it we could even go down in it oh dude that sounds awesome well, what other thing happens in our world that's exactly like that within this paradigm it's a massive multiplayer online game we've done it you can crawl into world of warcraft it's not infinite, but by God, it'll keep you going for years and years, man. And you won't have remotely experienced it all. Hell, Fallout 4 is so big, I haven't experienced it all. All right. There you go. You've seen a doll inside of a doll. Do you really need an infinite amount of them going down? Because guess what? The last version of um, most games have these. They have little parlor games inside the game. And so there's like a match... Um, a memory game now embedded in the latest expansion of World of Warcraft. There's games where you untangle strings between nodes. There's your little Russian doll inside that game. You can bring up a little Hearthstone, you know, game on the on the ground, which is another game Blizzard makes on the outside, and you can fake like you're playing it. Hmm. So then we get to this idea of, is there interaction? How many of you have ever wanted to see a ghost, like a real one? Like when I saw Walt, he was in my brain. He wasn't, I mean, he was kind of an apparition in front of me, but it wasn't anything I thought anyone else could see. And obviously nobody did. But how many times have you really wanted to see one? And you're in your bedroom real late at night and you call on someone, maybe someone recently passed, maybe just someone. And you just beg them, you know, God, you just, dude, could you just show up? Could you just make something happen in the room? And then you start to think about it as an engineer, like I do. And you go, oh, crap, maybe that's not even possible. Maybe the system isn't hooked up to do that. How would I actually see a ghost? I mean, in standard physics, how would I see a ghost? Well, some entity on a different non-mass plane, a spiritual plane, Meaning they can be in the room with you and the ether goes through them. It doesn't even bother moving a little bit because it's just they don't interact with each other. They can't touch each other necessarily. But that spiritual being 
could maybe wave their little magic hands and start to create verbal reactions to the ether, and thus create photons, and they could make some sort of cloud in your room, some apparition. Could be just a little cloudy thing. They're just waving their hand in a circle, just like some like sparklers or, or at night, you know. Or they could um, maybe push themselves into a form that you remember them by, and move through it in such a way, or just just I don't know, just vibrate in a way that you can see them. They glow in your room. Michael Jackson's in your room, right? But it never happens. It never happens because it would be silly to say that they would do it for one person and not for all of us. I mean, what would be the sense in that? Does your loved one not love you enough to come back and show you? Especially if you're a scientist and you make a pact, you go, dude, come back and show me. Will you do that? Oh yeah, totally. Never happens. So if it was allowed and possible, then it would be a certainty. And that's not what we see, is it? Well, then you get to the old theory of the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect is in part sort of the programming mechanism that I'm talking about. A butterfly flies a certain way in Peru, and eventually it affects the price of tea in China. It's an absurd analogy to show you how that is actually possible. It is actually possible. It causes change. Change reverberates. Now, it might take, you know, a thousand years for that to actually occur through some weird bunch of connections. Douglas Adams had a really funny thing where he said that you could extrapolate the entire universe out of a slice of fairy cake. It's just brilliant. He was right on it, man, the 70s. So if they're going to affect change, then is it something that is a part of the initial program? That the program says, well, if someone requests this thing, then then there's going to be this opening that will have a little, you know, red light that comes on the outside. Okay, Joey is in his bedroom. He wants to see his uncle again. So, uncle, you're dead, right? Yeah, okay, so your soul's out here. Good. Now, this is the XYZ that you need to go to. This, this bubble here is a T time, and you need to go right there to his bedroom because Earth is like flying through the universe, okay? So you need to get right there and hold yourself into that realm and then wiggle and then he can see you. Okay, great. Doesn't happen. Hmm. In the movie The Matrix, it was very powerful because there was the outside organic world which was very arbitrary and random as the world truly exists. And then you had this very intentional mimicry of a previous state of the outside world, which was society in this sort of normal grind. And I don't remember what city it was, New York or wherever it was set, right? And so the code, which flowed on the screens, which, you know, if you don't remember, the, the folks that were looking at the code didn't see code. They saw the world. They saw people in the code because their brains started to translate it. That was one of the coolest things they did in that movie. But that would be sort of the intellect of our Matrix code programmers as well. They could simply look at an ethereal win and say, oh, wow, there's going to be a baby here in any time now. Someone must be having sex somewhere, you know, poof. Oh, yeah, there it is right there. I knew it. That's, that's the wave it makes before it, you know, creates a fetus or whatever. Someone's in love in this room. Can you smell the ether? Oh, yeah, I totally smell it, yeah. But it's not, most likely, the ether that's controlling all elements. It's a bunch of stuff on top of itself. Okay, let's go a little bit deeper. As if we can. Does one control the other? Does the ether that makes up this universe obey the soul energy? Does the soul energy obey the ethereal energy? Do they have their own proprietary universes and they can interact if someone wills it to exist? Mm -hmm. Deep, right? Well, let me give you one at the moment of conception. Once the sperm penetrates the egg, obviously magic is happening inside that egg. It is like, on a protein level, it is mind-blowing what's going on inside that thing. And then eventually DNA starts to behave as the protein patterns tell it to behave. 
but the first moment of tangible magic that humans can see is a heartbeat. And what is a heartbeat? It's some fluid going from point A to point B with a moment of compression. And the moment of compression builds up, but then poof, you get a little beat. It's sort of like if you had your hose kinked in your backyard and it's got pressure. Now we know how that really works. It doesn't unkink right? because the rubber is always stronger than the, the water. And so we don't get that kink. But if it was a weak rubber, which we never make hoses out of, it might build up on the kink, burst through the kink, but then the kink reconstitutes itself and compresses again. And then there's a burst and there's a rhythm to it because the flow of water has a constant amplification, right? The flow, boom, pop, pop, pop. Okay. Well, let me just throw you as an example that the soul energy that shows up to give this being its sentient form, having lived a previous life, it does this little magic thing. And the magic thing is it creates the kink. The kink is created by the soul. The ether obeys because it has it doesn't care. It's just inert stuff. It doesn't have a consciousness itself. The soul has a consciousness. And the soul is there as sort of the hands of God to mulch the proteins, to make sure it grows into whatever the heck it's supposed to be, a hamster, a human, whatever, hominid, Bigfoot, whatever. And it's doing this thing. And it's sitting there nurturing for nine months. But eventually, the being gets to a point where it starts to take over. Well, well before the nine-month period occurs, the soul just moves in. It moves into this sort of brainstem, pineal gland thing. By the way, I watched this episode. This absolute idiot. Let's do a little rendition here. You don't speak English specifically. I don't know about your language, but in English, there's some very basic rules about how to pronounce vowels. Because I heard this guy see it's pineal. Okay, let's go back to grade school here. Ready? Real simple, simple thing here. Two vowels separated by a consonant. A single consonant makes the first vowel long. What's long mean? Long means you pronounce it as you say it in the alphabet. A, B, C. Well, you only have A, E, I, O, and U, right? Sometimes why? But I, you know? So, because pineal gland it only has an in between the i and the following vowel it's pineal it's dissect two s's make the i short therefore it becomes i not i but because we have so much fucking illiteracy in the united states of america these dictionaries are caving into these these people that can't speak english it's crazy and we say a bunch of shit wrong that the british still say correct it's cement really sorry it's not cement, it's semen. It's only one M between the two vowels. Mm. Anyway, but I think the soul attaches to the brainstem, right at the tippy top, right as it junctions into the brain itself. But I think that the overall soul area that it might occupy is, quite frankly, bigger than your brain cavity. It's sort of in a different, well, it doesn't, worry about mass it doesn't have like this oh there's a there's a skull here i gotta stay within the skull uh, there's no need for that as far as we know our souls are as big as the universe who knows right that's why when they feed you a bunch of poisons and they rot your pineal gland you start to lose your access to your soul you start to lose this consciousness that you've developed what the buddhists call your mind right between your body and your soul is your consciousness. If you impair your vessel, you impair your liaison relationship with your soul, your true being. But because we adopt our consciousness as our reality, that's why scientists don't believe in souls. Because they will open up a brain cavity, push all over the brain, and people get all these memories and do all these weird things. I can taste strawberries. They're just short-circuiting the overall previously accurate matrix which is your brain that has a great relationship with your soul meaning for every 
red wire, there's a red contact. Every blue wire, there's a blue contact. Well, the scientists are in there jarbling up all, you know, garbling up all the wire connections. And so, yeah, a bunch of weird shit's going to happen. That's not proof you live inside your brain, <laughs> you know? You're just damaging the connection. What's so funny about it is, I'll give you an analogy you can use, which is very simple for everyone to understand. Back in the day, TVs had antennas on the top of them. Radios just had antennas somewhere in the car, somewhere above them, somewhere embedded inside the case. And you have to tune your frequencies and tune all your oscillators and all that good stuff to get it to, to do a decent job. But you'll remember, if you were old, that, uh, you know, hey, if the antenna was in the wrong place, the antenna was damaged, or the broadcast wasn't strong enough to get to wherever the hell you lived, you had a crappy picture. In fact, you could lose the entire channel. So you would hold on to the antenna with your body, you use your body as an antenna, you'd put a bunch of extra wire and run it out the back door and up the roof, and you get a better picture. You get a better radio station. But according to scientists, uh, the radio station lives inside your TV. Uh, at, the, at the best, scientists would suggest that if the picture ceases to exist on your TV, so too does the studio cease to exist on the other side. Because see, it doesn't work, man. Can't get it, can't you? Know, you know, it's like so. And you eat a bunch of toxins, a bunch of aluminum, mercury from flu shots and all that crap. You brush your teeth with fluoride, which rots your pineal gland, gives you osteoporosis. You microwave your food, which completely screws up all of your electrical communications in your body. You eat all these processed dead meats. You are going to damage your vessel. You know, I don't need to lecture you, but, you know, we were made perfect and the earth was made perfect to, to sustain us and heal us. Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. If we keep on the warpath we're on today, we'll be extinct before you know it. Cancer is pretty much um, the fingerprint of the globalists screwing with us. If you get cancer or someone else gets cancer, that is a fingerprint of a toxin that you were exposed to, whether it be electromagnetic, chemical, or through malnutrition. That is why cancer exists. Your body's being starved of what it needs to recreate itself, and so it creates bad information, which turns into corrupted cells. You can't heal from it. Go see my episode on cancer, but you could... Get yourself reinfected. You can get totally different types of cancer depending on how you expose yourself. So be good to yourself. Go back to basics, is what I always say. And just remember all dominant species on this planet eat meat. So just bear that in mind, okay? You might be able to coexist with human beings not eating it, but you will not be the dominant species on this planet, I guarantee you. So the very conception of being a matrix programmer starts to just hurt the brain. When you just start to think about just the few things that we've mentioned, the few paradigms of existence that we've mentioned, and we really haven't talked about how or even why there would be another timetable that would be a duplicate of us. If nonlinear time exists, what I would suggest is this. It wouldn't be anything intentional from a programmer, unless they're trying to create drastic differences for experimental reasons only. And we see this in our own software, right? We don't write, we don't write every conceivable version of Microsoft Word that could exist just to see if we could do it. You know, it's like, imagine like there's a print button somewhere on the screen and you just move it one pixel over every version until it's to the other side of the screen or it's everywhere all over the screen. I mean, that's just pointless exercise and a waste of energy and time. If that exists, then maybe there's no God. Maybe that we're just here. Seems sort of weird. We seem to be so intelligently designed. And Earth, I think that uh, one of the... I, I've said this several times, but I think I'm going to say a little clearer and a little shorter this time. Earth, for me, personally, is a thousand percent designed. Meaning, we don't have a bunch of weird life in this world. We don't. All things, in fact, in my opinion, 
if you have style, if you understand design, if you look at Sid Mead's stuff and you go, damn, that's just fucking cool, then you will have no problem looking at every fish, every insect, every human and go, wow, aren't we amazing? I mean, yeah, that chick with the gigantic brow across her face is a little different than my community, but in her world, she is gorgeous, you know? And so when you look at the fact that we don't have, you know, apparitional um, beings, you know, we don't have like, I don't know, like just take taffy when it's really hot and throw it in the air and then just see it float there. And then it's just got like an eyeball on one side and teeth on the other side. We don't see any of that crap. We see utter and complete perfection. I was watching a documentary. Well, whatever. This dude has a channel on, I don't know what the hell they call that shit, a video on YouTube. Okay. Of a dude chasing around, and I strongly re recommend you go and look at this because it'll just, if it has any effect on you like it does on me, it just it so proves the experience. But he was running around the world finding the largest flowers that exist on planet Earth. And there's this weird common denominator of the biggest flowers in the world. And I mean, not a flower that's made of a bunch of little ones necessarily because those exist as well. And technically speaking, some of these big ones have that sort of molecular definition, but it's whatever. One of the biggest flowers, and I can't say the name because it's some hugely scientific name, but there's a flower that looks like your standard flower a little bit. The thing is like three meters, or sorry, a meter across, excuse me, like a three foot wide thing. And it's, it looks like flesh. It looks like rotting flesh, kind of like rotting inside of muscle tissue. The center is this just hellhole thing, man. It's like, uh, it just has like these spikes all over it. And it's just, it looks like, like the devil's hemorrhoid or something, man. It is really gross. But at the same time, you look at it and you think, this could be my first year in 3D class creating a sculpted 3D thing. The thing, okay, so all these flowers, and one of them, uh, this whole species of flowers that grow really, really tall, they're like, you know, three to four meters tall, and they look like just a big um, orchid, like a giant orchid, but they all have the same trait. They stink like rotting flesh, like rotting meat. I mean, maybe not flesh, hell, I don't know what that's like, but, and the guy, you know, puts his face in, he takes his huge breath and he's like, oh my God, he goes, just smells like rotting, you know, meat. But he goes, that's how this thing pollinates itself is it creates this huge stink cloud that you can't see, but it draws all these flies to it, jungle flies. And just roaming around on the surface of this fly, or sorry, this flower, it pollinates the flower. Uh, the big, tall, orchid looking ones actually have the male and female um equipment inside so but they still need something to crawl in there and move it from one side to the other and i think the male organ dies first and releases its sperm and then it you know pollinates over to the female i mean it's just it's just insane for me whatever's going on i can reduce a little bit of the burden of the programming of infinite randomness because i think i'm seeing quite definitively the beauty in all things it's just crazy if anything, if anyone creates anything unattractive in this world, it's mankind by just experimenting with stuff, right? Anyway, I wanted to take us down this path to kind of, you know, move the football maybe like half a yard in the conversation. Like I've said several times, I think that for those of us that fantasize about being a matrix, the the other fantasy that uh, that arrives fairly quickly in the mind is one that might suggest, well, if we figure out how this place is made, we can control it. You know, we could time travel. We could at least, even in linear time, uh, move from one place to another very quickly and back, you know. You want to go to the moon surface? Well, just do this flip-flop flim thing, and then boom, you're on the moon surface. I'm going to bring yourself some oxygen and a nice spacesuit that NASA didn't make. But I think it's valuable because, you know, a lot of people are caught up in, you know, man-made religions about how the world works, which if at best, if accurate, is merely describing the soul layer. You know, how it's realized, who cares? Could a Christ come down to a world that is made of applesauce and no ether? Sure. 
you still need to get along. So you got to figure out something, how to, you know, some methodology of pulling that off. So there's value to that too. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments. This is going to be a um, really bizarre episode, but I just was sitting around thinking, I was thinking, you know, these things have been floating around in my mind, this infinite gobbledygook. And I just keep thinking, how would this all come together? And this is sort of my first wave of explaining that. I probably won't get to another episode in quite a while on this subject unless you guys can trigger something in my brain. But anyway, if you made it to the end, thank you very much. If you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, I'm going to give you the short pitch tonight. There's two video, plenty of audio. There's uh, three social medias. There's two ways to donate. There's a store. And there is season one on its own channel because it's all been made more better. Take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.